Hello, I'm Josh Widdicombe and welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. Josh Widdicombe, welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you today? I'm good, I'm all right, yeah. Not bad, you know. Another day, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> Sorry, indeed. Day number 9,476, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is, is that right? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I, do you know what? I know this is like, but they always say, and the, not to compare our situation to them, but the way to get through prison is to have a routine. And the way to get through lockdown, I think, is to have a routine. And then yeah. each day is like, oh, I know what I'm doing with it. I'm not waiting for, you know, them to open the pubs again. Exactly. Now it's just waking up, checking out what new stuff's on Netflix and then watching that until you pass out at five in the morning and repeating it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But that's the routine. Yeah. I want to take you back to, you studied sociology and linguistics at a university. How did you first get into comedy and what were your first gigs like? Uh, so I went to uni. The reason I did those subjects was I kind of I was going to take a year out after A level and I just kind of drifted into. I thought, I'm just going to do nothing with this year. So I went to Manchester. Uh, I was just like, oh, I'm all right at those things and those course, they're like available. So I'll just do that. Uh, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do in my life. And then I got a few jobs in um, like offices, good jobs, like fun jobs. But I just, I was like kind of rudderless and didn't really like what I was doing. So I was like, I'll just do a gig. And the first gig was in a pub in Earl's Court. And I genuinely believe if that had gone badly, I just would have quit then. And I think that's totally, there's loads of comedians that would have been brilliant, but I got lucky with my first gig. And then when I was having bad gigs after that, I knew that it could go well. So it kind of powered me on through it. There's a fork in the road there that if that gig had gone badly, God knows. When you were growing up, what did you imagine yourself doing? Footballer. Um, no, I, I, I never knew what I wanted to do. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I didn't, I was always really loved comedy, but from a fan point of view, like when I was growing up in the nineties, there was lots of things. It was a great golden era for comedy from the far show to shooting stars, to fantasy football league, to father Ted, like whatever you, whether you can still watch that now or like through to, you know, Mrs. Murr and the Royal Family, the office at the end, it was like the golden era. And I loved all this stuff. And I presumed everyone did. And then I think it turned out that I was a better, um, kind of uh, bigger, not better. I was a more of a dweeb, really, a fan than anyone else was. And I liked comedy, but I'd never thought about performing it, really. I just did it to try something, really. It's not like I wasn't the class clown. Right. And now that you've got to the stage in your career, have you got any advice for anyone just starting out in comedy? Of course, perseverance. Anything else? Yeah, it's full. Um, no, um, I would say my advice would be that you should... Um, you're never as good... Uh, this is the best bit of advice, is you're never as good as you think you are after a good gig, but you're never as bad as you think you are after a bad gig. You're somewhere in between. So don't get too cocky if you have a good gig. But don't be too down on yourself after a bad gig because neither of those things are true. Um, and also, just do your gigs and work. It's not so much about doing loads of gigs, but do loads of gigs, but it's about learning from each gig and trying to improve. Because if you just keep doing the same gig a hundred times and it goes well, some, then you're not kind of, there's no point doing the gigs. So try and learn and get better. A lot of the comedians I've spoken to, a goal at one point in their career would be to be on live at the Apollo. Now, you've obviously done that. Have you got mm. a next kind of benchmark for you? Would it be performing at the O2 or performing in America? What would it be? Um, I would, I, do you know what? This is terrible, but like, I, I, I've, America's not really a goal for me. I'm really kind of like parochial in my like comedy taste when I was growing up I watched all the kind of English TV I did so it was like apart from the Simpsons I loved and friends and stuff but also I've worked for like 10 years to get to where I am in UK comedy the thought of starting again from the bottom in America is like more than I can handle um no my goal really is just to I really like what I'm doing and it's just to always just keep doing what I'm doing but always be trying new things and doing new kind of aims for what you would um want to um like to keep myself interested 
it's like I love doing what I do. I love doing the last leg. I love doing hypothetical. I love doing stand up. I love doing the nineties football podcast that I've been doing for a few years. But I think every year I like to try and do one new thing that keeps me on my toes, makes me terrified, and makes me kind of scared that it's going to be shit and I'm going to be found out. So in this year's case is a show then. You're yeah, and it wasn't meant to be. Obviously, it would be in here. <laughs> if that was my plan at the start of the year was to do a. Something about lockdown parenting, that would have been very prescient. But like, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd have questions to answer at top governmental levels, I think. But um, I think, no, I genuinely, what's amazing is this has happened in like two weeks. Mm. Like me and Rob have been complaining about parenting. And I, I, I realised that like, it's, I've only got one daughter, but like, it's really intense. It's a long day. And then at the end of the day, when she goes to sleep, me and my wife like find ourselves on our WhatsApp groups that we are with parents, yeah. just complaining about what our day has been and make ourselves feel better by venting to people and having them vent to us and thinking, oh, thank God, their day is worse than my day. And then Rob is definitely having a worse time than me, which I'm delighted about. <laughs> and um, so this is just a way of like, it's like, a, we're just like, oh, that'd be a really fun podcast to do. Yeah. Well, we get to vent and feel better and we get to speak to our kind of comedy friends and let them vent and make us feel better and let them feel better. And also, hopefully, listeners that are in the same position as us can feel better as well. You know, it's like, it's just cathartic more than Absolutely. anything. Now, the podcast is called A Lockdown Parenting Hell. And the first episode is out already. It's got Catherine Ryan in it. It's very funny. It's very entertaining. And it's also very relatable. And I believe the next episode's out on Friday with John Richardson. Yeah. Um, and John Richardson, obviously, um, for anyone who's aware of John Richardson, would imagine <laughs> what his attitude is. Uh, he's, you know, he, do you know what? He was the first person name on the team sheet in that sense. You're just like, I, I want to speak to John. John's the person that we want to, like, talk to about it. And That's Catherine true. was brilliant because Catherine has got a 10-year-old, so it's a completely different mm. situation here, Rob. And it makes you go, oh, right, yeah, there's... It's, I thought it got better. It just gets different. Do you know what I mean? So Literally. she was so funny and brilliant and John is. And, and then we're speaking to Lucy Beaumont, who's a brilliant comedian. She's married to John. They do the show Meet the Richardsons on Dave. And um, so we're speaking to her in episode three. So you can kind of compare and contrast their own understandings of the same situations, which is good. Oh, yeah, that's going to be very interesting. Yeah. Now, I must ask you, having listened to your podcast, of course, which I recommend everyone does, how are your mango supplies going at the moment? <laughs> my mango supplies are running quite low. Mm. So my daughter's addicted to mango, which is the most middle class problem you could ever have, <laughs> obviously. But like, I bought, so you, we go to like, I live in um, East London and I haven't had to go to the supermarkets because there's like nice independent shops that are actually much easier to go into than Tesco, which is a long, long queue. Uh, so, so shopping's not been as bad for me in this sense as it has been for other people. But they just had the, the organic shop near us had mangoes. And I thought, I'll buy one mango. That'll be like a nice cultural thing she can enjoy. And man, it's like crack. It's just she can't get enough of it. And now we've got two mangoes in the fridge, but like every meal is a like... And then she tricked me the other day. She was like... So I was like, oh, you can have mango for your pudding. But when she knows it's pudding, she doesn't eat her mane. Mm -hmm. So I was like, what if we start with the mango and then you eat your yeah. mane? What an idiot. And then she's eating the mango. She's got no interest in the mane. So I know people have got bigger problems. I'm fully aware of that. And that we're aware of that on the podcast. But you still want to be able to have a little rant about your own problems, right? Well, yeah, because a mango is very filling and nutritionally rich. So after she's enjoyed a mango, she probably doesn't want her mane. She's satiated. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and you know what? It's fruit. That's good, isn't it? It's very good. I know it's got sugar and stuff, but she's growing. I think the fact she's eating any fruit I'm seeing is a positive. I think so. I don't want to hype up the mango too much because it'll make it harder for you to get said mango. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Yeah. 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 I don't what I don't want to do is start a trend that then bites me on the ass, really. Do Nightmare. I? Yeah. But it has caused you problems as well, hasn't it? So Yeah. Yeah, I think, well, I think that's the pro. like, oh yeah, like I've, I also got into this situation where we're going to go to the park and we have to take, she's like, can I eat them some mango in the park? So I have to put in like Tupperware and then we take it 
And then you have this situation where I'm like, don't sit down while you're eating that because that will constitute a picnic and that is breaking the rules. <laughs> so you have to eat mango. You have to be moving while you eat mango because I, I just cannot be caught picnicking in this current situation. The whole thing. Oh, you know, life is all right, isn't it? But see, what worries me is, so it's okay to go out for a jog or a run, which I don't think I can physically do unless I'm late for a bus or a meeting or something yeah. anyway. And if I did go for a jog, I would definitely need to collapse on the floor for at least 10 hours and people would assume I was sunbathing and I wasn't. I was just trying <laughs> to recuperate oxygen. Well, so exactly. I just decided not to. Yeah, it's, it's a terror. That, I think you're doing the right thing there. You know what you're doing? You're doing a public service. and People, yeah. people should talk about you like they talk about Captain Tom because what you're doing is saving the NHS by not going for a run so it's, it's quite definitely. similar yeah very similar very yeah. very similar except for the whole money thing but apart from that yeah, thing. yeah. yeah. <laughs> now I must ask you two you famously worked on the Dora the Explorer magazine back in 2010 but my question yeah. to you is this recently there was a live action adaptation of Dora yeah. the Explorer have you seen it and if so what were your thoughts no, I haven't seen it. I saw it on the side of a bus and she... Was it projected? No, it was, it was, it was, <laughs> like, a, it was like a promise to the EU, the, the EU 350,000 thing. It was Dora the Explorer advert and she was a grown-up, right? And Dora's not. She's six. Yeah. So for a start, I was, at that point, I was like, I'm out here. And it, it, obviously it's gone live action. Um, I should watch it really as a kind of personal interest but I suppose I don't know how it did whether it was well reviewed or anything but I suppose there's a chance I'll end up watching it in four or five years when my daughter's interested in it absolutely um, yeah I mean it was kind of a fun film yeah was it have you seen it yeah I've seen it I went to a press screening of it whenever it was oh, yeah. last year and it was yeah it was enjoyable and how similar is it to the original cartoon? I obviously, or have you not seen the original cartoon? I've not seen a lot of it. I've seen bits of it. I do like how they would occasionally just explain a word to you in Spanish. Yeah, so does that happen in the film? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And does she talk to the map? Is the map a figure in the film? I can't remember. There's a monkey in it. Yeah, I've only seen it the once and I haven't really thought about it too much since. <laughs> there's a map in it. I think there's a monkey in it. And yeah, but it's got it. It's a fun family film. Oh, that's good. I will watch it. I'll get around to it. Now, you were also in the very first, first series of Taskmaster, which you won. And you yeah. returned for the Champions of Champions series, which you also won. Mm. What were your favourite tasks? And is oh, there that's anything, a great question. And is there uh, anything now that you would go back and perhaps do differently or approach differently? Yeah, I wouldn't get the tattoo that I got. Um, <laughs> is it, uh, does it say Greg? Yeah, it just says Greg. Could you add another G and an S and do a tribute to the... the Good, if, 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 if the fee was right, I would, mm. yeah. But obviously, you know, <laughs> their people would need to talk to my people. I can show you the tattoo. Yeah, PC. Uh, does that read? Yeah, so you it can does, see it's yeah. still there. Um, there you go. There's a low moment in my career. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, um, I wouldn't change anything. I really enjoyed it. Um, I didn't enjoy riding the horse. That I found that quite scary when I was riding a horse um uh god thinking back to what tasks i did and how they went it was like you know i i ate a mel watermelon that was the first ever task i did and i thought i'd done quite well at it and i was so slow at it, it turned out and then romesh genuinely almost kind of drowned himself <laughs> like <laughs> didn't he throw it on the floor and destroy it and then eat it off the floor yeah, yeah, so that's what Rom did, like, and it was mad that he did that. And I was just like spooning it in. And now I think, because like, obviously that would have been, that was the first ever task on the first ever Taskmaster. So now everyone knows the drill and stuff. Yeah. And you know, like, I'm really glad I got to do it without knowing what it was, if that makes sense. And not yeah. thinking about how other people would do, because you were just in your own world and you were just hanging out with Alex and the two Andys that make it. And it, they're such nice people to hang out with. It was just a lovely... I, I don't think I'd ever enjoy a TV show as much as I enjoyed those days doing Taskmaster. It will always be my favourite job. I will, Unless I get very, very lucky, it will always be the best job I've had. Would you say the low light, though, was Alex eating food off of your face? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that was... I'd forgotten about that, yeah. Mm. 
uh, when he ate the mask. Yeah. Yeah, and wasn't there like, I had like a sweet tongue, didn't I? He you did, yeah, and he ate quite a lot of that. Yeah, no, that wasn't a low light, that was a highlight. <laughs> That's where it should be. Now, yep. in subsequent series, everyone, of course, won a cast of Greg's head, a statue, but you got a, like a karate trophy or something. And then when you won the Champion of Champions series, you also won a like golden statue of Greg's body as well. Do you have them both together? And if so, where are they? <laughs> so, um, the reason I won that trophy mm. was literally on the day of the final, they realised they didn't have a trophy. So they won went out it wasn't like they thought it'd be funny to do a karate trophy or something they literally just had to go to like a local timson's or whatever and say <laughs> what trophy have you got so that's how i ended up with that i didn't end up with that you know um because well, we all got drunk afterwards and i just ripped the front bit off that said winner and i've got that somewhere up here in my room um and like uh but i didn't take the full trophy because it was big um did they keep it and then did i end up with it on champion of champions i can't remember on Champion um, of Champions, they, they brought out a karate medal again and sort of said, I don't know if it was just one that they had again just bought for that day, but they said, right. if you won, then that would slot, slot into the top. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so I won the huge Greg, right? And yeah. um, it was, uh, obviously I didn't want it, but I did own it. So I thought it would be funny to get it sent to the offices of my agent. Oh, wow. So, and uh, so they've still got it in there, like, cafe you know like not cafe like the kitchen area that you'd have a, a you know like a, a trendy media office so right. they've got a nice kitchen really lovely office with a nice kitchen and then there's this huge six foot six greg davis <laughs> stood in the corner i think they put pants on it and they've got like great you know there's people going in there that were michael mcintyre and alan carr and lee evans and jack d like proper proper comics not like me and like and then and they must be serious going what the hell is that doing in your offices so i think it's still there yeah your series josh has run for three series so far is there any chance of a fourth no there isn't no that kind of ran it's um it's length it was it's a it's, it's a long old job writing a sitcom mm. and i really loved it and i loved the people that were in it and the people that i worked with but it was, I'd say it's the most kind of stressful thing I've ever done in my career by about a million miles and the most kind of all encompassing thing. And if you want to do kind of other stuff, you, you can't really lose six months of your life every year to something like that. I, one day again, I'd love to do a sitcom, like write yeah. a sitcom. Um, whether I'd be in it or not, I'm not really, that's not really what I was in it for. I really loved writing it. And I love working with Tom, who I, wrote with who I, Tom Crane, who I write a lot on other things with. Um, and I'd love to do that again, but you can only do so much. Do you know what I mean? And it was pretty all encompassing. Yeah, because there, there were some amazing guest stars on the show as well. Which were your favourite to work with? Jennifer Saunders was amazing to get on, obviously. Um, obviously, Jack D was brilliant. Miles Jupp was great. Um, just trying to think, then you're just going, um, Tamsin Alfway, you're like, that's, that's, um mel from east enders like that was quite yeah that's quite a kind of surreal situation to be in like it was a great experience and it was really really fun and i loved it um and it's kind of but it's really really stressful writing stuff yeah. that other people have then got to say and you know getting everything right and it's whew, it's tiring it's a lot less tiring just to complain into a microphone with Rob Beckett for half an hour from your own home. It's very true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, on a series seven, I think, would I lie to you? Yeah. Your story was that you'd had some books of shorts, I think, for about 12 <laughs> years, and they were in somewhat of a state of disrepair. They had holes in them. They, they looked yeah. quite old, let's say. They, they looked well-loved. <laughs> you still have them? No. Do you know who's got them oh, now? Gidroik, who got them... Didn't I gave them to her on the show, I think. Yeah, and yeah. So, I, I mean, I don't know whether she's still got them. But the last I knew was um, that she did leave the green room with them. <laughs> I've got a photo of her in the green room. I don't know if it, it's probably before my current camera roll on my phone, so maybe I haven't got it. But, like, I remember having a photo of her holding them in the green room. And they were washed. Yeah. You know. 
yeah and um so she would be the person to ask i don't know if you've ever interviewed mel or if you're oh, yeah but now, now i need to now you need to now you yeah. need to well, at the very least i'm going to be looking out for her on tv and see if she's got like an elastic mark on her forehead. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah exactly then you'll know <laughs> you've been on the last leg since 2012 and it's run for 18 series i believe how did yeah. you first get involved with the show and what do you attribute to its lasting success um i got involved because um I genuinely was, we had a meeting, me and my agent, we met this guy called Pete in a Starbucks. And he was like, do you want to spend 10 days doing this kind of show about, I didn't know much about the Paralympics. Like I'm not going to pretend I did. Um, like, cause I only really know about football when it comes to sport. And like, um, he said, do you want to do this show 10 nights in the Paralympics? And I was like, yeah, why not? I'll get some free tickets to go to the Paralympics. That'd be great. And then no one's ever going to probably watch it because it's on at 11 p.m. on E4 or whatever. And then I'll get to go to the Paralympics and great. And then it kind of got moved to Channel 4 at 10 p.m. And then it was good. Do you know? Like, and people liked it. And me and Adam and Alex got on well and had this chemistry that, you know, is luck generally those kind of things you can you know you could have cast it forever and i don't think they did i i, I think you know it was i don't think they went would well, adam alex josh work together and then it was really good and people liked it and i think the reason it's successful really is there was no pressure on it at the start mm -hmm. so it was able to find its own voice and it was able to become what it is now and i genuinely think what it is now is complete mess that you would never pitch. What an awful idea for a TV show. Uh, and so you would never pitch it as it is, but it was able to grow into what it was and people were able to find it and they didn't feel like there were too much pressure on them to like it because it's the new big thing. And I think it kind of, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of things fell into place and now it is what it is really. But okay. there was no, no one knew this was going to happen. And if they tell you they did, then they're lying. <laughs> You're, of course, very busy. You also co-host Hypothetical on Dave with James Acaster. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of hypothetical oh. questions for you, if you'll indulge me. I will, yeah. Fantastic. The first one is, would you rather have uncooked cinema hot dog sausages as fingers or singing goldfish as toes? As toes? Oh, singing goldfish as toes, right? Right, because yeah. The fingers are out and they're going to fall apart. And they're, long. Gonna snap. they're long. Yeah. The toes are, I've already got the tattoo that I'm covering up. So there's not as much of a problem there. And then when you wear sandals in summer, the singing goldfish is the sound of summer. Do you know oh, yeah. what? I, even if the option wasn't the other one, I, the goldfish sounds like a, <laughs> joy, like a lovely joy. I think so. I felt like you'd probably lean towards that one. Yeah. 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 Also, you know, with so many jokes about legs on the last leg, it would give it a new kind of pizzazz to have oh, that element to it, wouldn't it? Really would. This is very true. Yeah. Like it'd be some really nice foreshadowing eight years in advance. Exactly. 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 Yeah. My next question for you is, if you had to pick one of the following three shows for each thing, and the three shows are Hypothetical, The Last Leg, and Josh, which of the following things would you give them? So one show would be renewed forever with an unlimited budget. Right. The other would be turned into a musical. And the <laughs> third, you'd have to co-star with a mime artist. Mime artist, that's a great, yeah. great question. That's maybe the best question I've ever been asked in an interview, so thank you on that. Um, my question, so my answers are as follows. The musical of The Last Leg would be excellent, I think, actually. Um, because, uh, like, you know, it's a good story. You've got Adam and Alex. Uh, there's a lot of things that rhyme with leg. There's a lot of things that rhyme with foot. True. Not many things that rhyme with Paralympics apart from Olympics. Um, but I'd love to see The Last Leg, the musical. I would, can't imagine anything I'd enjoy more or less at the same time. Um, so there, uh, and so I'd go with the mime person for, um, 
for Josh because I think that would be an interesting character. And I think Ellis would be good as a mime. Um, so if he could do that, that would be good. He's very expressive in the eyes. So I think he'd get away with that. So then I'd go with hypothetical being renewed forever because I love working with James. And also, um, you know, um, it's a laugh, isn't it? And it's the one I've done the least of. So maybe it's the one I'm yeah. the least tired with. So <laughs> like, um, maybe I can imagine doing it forever. Wow, that's fantastic. Last three years and I'll be saying, I couldn't imagine doing any more of that. <laughs> Well, now having thought about all of that, I kind of want it all to happen. Me too. Yeah, Me just too. Go pitch all of it. I was the last leg musical would be. I mean, they made musicals about worse, haven't they? Yeah, but it'd be so great because you could keep the same format. You could have different guests coming in that sing, and yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. And he obviously loves to sing, so he could play himself. Mm. There you go. It's perfect. Should make that yeah. happen. So my, my next question for you is, how much money would it take for you to carry an orange traffic cone around all year and introduce yourself as Josh with a cone? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> so I didn't know where that was going, but that's very, I, I like the way you've worked back to that. I would say it would really ruin my career, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would really, oh, no. I'm, it would be a career-ending decision, I think, because even a year yeah. on, I think too many doors would have closed. Um, well, so, especially if you had it on your head. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would, I'd, and I'd ruin, lose my relationship. Mm. And so, you know, there's a lot I'd lose. So maybe £3,000? Yeah, that makes sense. I think, yeah, that, that balances quite nicely. Yeah, exactly. Plus, as I say, you get the cone. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Like, that's in free. Yeah. So three thousand pounds cone rental, brilliant. Yeah, perfect. You've perfect. got your own parking whenever you want you have, it. You can just put a cone out. Exactly. Do you have to give the cone back at the end of the year? You have it for a year, yeah. Oh right. Well, you probably get yeah. quite attached to it, and then have to buy it back for three thousand pounds. The grand at the end, but yeah, you know that's a lovely kind of moral tale, isn't it? I think I mean, so. That's, that's your musical. There you go. Now, another game you, of course, play on hypothetical is Big Hat, Small Hat. Mm. So, Joshua Dickham, I must ask you, if you had to wear a big hat or a small hat for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? These are the hats. Oh, amazing. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, that's great. Um, I'm just going to take a photo of that. You should. Yeah. Um, if only I thought to record this. <laughs> um, so, I would go big hat. Um, yeah. sorry, I look like a steampunk almost, don't I? Um, I think, like, I think uh, the reason I go big hat is I've got a mm. large head, like physically. Um, mm. Others can judge whether that means personality-wise. I've got a large head, which means that I basically, I can't fit even a normal hat on. So a big hat would fit like a normal hat to me. Right. So I'd love to be in a situation where I could live wearing a normal hat like other people do. So I'd go big hat. So this particular hat, the one you've chosen, has a bit of a story to it. I was sent this by the people promoting The Greatest Shaman, and it was made by the costume designer of The Greatest Shaman, and it's, I think, the, the design of it is Zendaya's costume in the film. Oh, so wow. they made, like, ten of these, like, ten bespoke hats or something, and this is one of them. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. So that's worth a bit as well. Probably. Yeah. That is, and what, where, what do you do with it? Like, where is it? Have you worn I'm it? I'm going to keep it in a box. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to rob you. It was on a shelf, actually, but it just started getting dusty and stuff. Yeah. And I thought I didn't want it to get messed up, so I just put it back in the box it came from on the shelf for an occasion such as this. Yeah, it's a good perk. Yeah. Now, you mentioned on Room 101 once that you, you well, to start with, you tried to put Lord of the Rings into Room 101, but then you mentioned that you had auditioned to be a Hobbit in the film The Hobbit. So what I was wondering was, how did you actually audition for that? Did you have to go to New Zealand? Did you send a video in? How did you go? Uh, I auditioned in some place in Soho. No, it, was, it wasn't Peter Jack. I didn't reach the Peter Jackson stage. I very much fell at the first hurdle. Um, I think, like... What I've heard since is that, um, like, they had already kind of cast Martin Freeman, I think. And, like, the contract was, like, taking ages. And I think they just got in a load of people they were never going to cast as a kind of 
hardball exercise. Mm. So I think I, I think I was being used. Mm. I think I was being used, but um, I don't know. Obviously, um, I'm not really into The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings, um, but I heard that Martin Freeman did an excellent job because he is excellent. Anyway, so um, they made the right decision. I, I fully back their decision. <laughs> so you could argue perhaps that they got him into the role because they were threatening to cast you and then he had <laughs> to do it. So the whole franchise exists basically because of you. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I'll take full credit. Thank that's you. Yeah, so you should. Good, good logic. <laughs> now, tell me a fun fact about you, a party trick, something we may not know. Um... Oh, I, I, I can name all the kind of neighbours cast from about 92 to 94. Mm -hmm. If you ask, like, if you gave me a character, yeah, you need to talk about setting yourself up for a fall. But, like, there's a certain period where I watched Neighbours so much that without trying, I, by osmosis, learned all the actors' names just because I saw the credits every day. Yeah. So now I know all of the actors. So that's kind of my party trick of those. I mean, you get to actually pull it out. It would have to be a bad party for me to pull that out. <laughs> I'll say I got into you know the the eighties TV show Prison Cell Block H. There was yeah, yeah. A, a remake of it called Wentworth Prison, and it's really right. good. There's lots of drama. It's very tense. It's quite violent as well. But when that finished last August, I decided to go back and start rewatching the original series. Yeah. Now there's a lot of people in the original Prison Cell Block H that then went on Harold Bishop even in oh, really? Smith, I think, but went on to be in Neighbours. Yeah. I much say that there's a reunion episode quite recently of Neighbours that had loads of Prisoner Cell Block H members in. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think, I think Jackie Woodburn, who played Susan Kennedy, might have been yeah. in Prisoner Cell yeah, Block H. Yeah, she was in it, yeah. Yeah. I think it's like the same... I mean, I might be wrong on this, but I think it's like, is it Red, Reg Grundy or whatever that made, made Neighbours mm. made Prisoner Cell Block H? And not only that, I think where Ramsey Street is filmed or was filmed is also where Prince of Cell Block H was filmed. I saw a, a, a oh, tour really? thing and the old building is still there. Oh, uh, because obviously, you know, the kind of Ramsey Street was a, um, is a normal street, obviously, in Melbourne. And like when I was growing up, I knew that fact, but I didn't understand. So I, there are people who are like, yeah, it's a normal street where people actually live in it. But I didn't mm. understand that that meant I presume they were using the interiors of the houses. I presume people were living in the houses because I didn't know how TV worked. So for years I was thinking, I wouldn't want to live there because they'd be filming in your house and you'd have to like keep it how they wanted. But obviously the set is different to the street. I've since found out. Huh? Is it ready? <laughs> no. I thought it was no, a documentary. No. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. And that's why Kylie's such a weird kind of anomaly because we all know she's really called Charlene. Well, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's go back to your podcast mm. with Rob Beckett. Have you got any tips for parents and people trying to survive the lockdown? Yeah, just don't judge yourself too harshly, I think. Mm -hmm. Like, I think um, if you are... I think the difficulty of lockdown parenting is as much this pressure for it to be this kind of time when you bond and you find these wonderful things out about your children and you know, and at the end of the day, it's tough and people aren't as having an easier time as they are claiming on Instagram and always remember that, that would be my tip. But now you also have another podcast as well called Quickly Kevin, which has been running since 2017, I believe. For the uninitiated, what is that about? It's a much more niche one than the parenting one. It's about 90s football uh, in which we interview 90s footballers uh, or fans of 90s football or... Um, anything like that really and um it's uh it's really fun but like uh it's it, it's a really fun job and i get to interview a lot of my heroes and we get to talk about silly things and remember silly things and to be honest it's a bit you know the, the kind of best things it turns out you do like last leg are often the things that are an accident mm. and we just thought it was a bit of a mess around me and chris who i started with and michael who i started it with just like us, no one's going to listen to this. And actually, it turns out there is an audience for niche football references. You say you like Neighbours from the 1990s, you like football from the 1990s. If you even started watching TV from the 2000s, yeah, you're going to love it. No, <laughs> no. I've, st I've just got to the millennium. That's where I've got to. Um, so I, uh, I, I'm slowly watching everything. 
I'm still, I'm still a, yeah, you know, things are still looking hopeful for Tony Blair where I am. <laughs> I mean, you've not even got to you yet. You've not even seen your own. No, exactly. Band. That's going to be a real surprise to me. I know. <laughs> It'll be incredible. Yeah. Now, have you got any messages for people watching the Sarah O'Connell show and your fans around the world? Um, in is this, this will be going down during lockdown, won't it? Um, yeah. I haven't yeah. checked the news recently, but I assume it'll still be. Going <laughs> um, yeah, if I did have a message, it would just be, um, you know, it's a really weird time. And it's it's okay, obviously. It's, I'd say it's okay to have bad days and it's okay to feel shit at this time. But if you have a good day and if you do enjoy, you know, your life during lockdown, that's not, you shouldn't feel guilty about that. You shouldn't feel bad about it because, you, you know, everyone's having a different experience and trying to make the best of this situation is all you can really do at this moment. That would be uh, what I would say. That's very good advice, and I completely agree with you. So, by the way, what are you doing with your days? Obviously, you're, you're creating a lot of podcasts and stuff like that. Are you writing stuff? Like, I parent from till about kind of lunchtime, mm. and then I get about four hours in the afternoon to work. So I'm doing... I was trying to write, um, and I'm just trying to write on projects that aren't really stressed or deadlining or anything like that yeah so it's just like pottering on things i've always thought i'd like to try and write something along those lines but things where it's very much at the stage where it may never leave the computer <laughs> yeah. well best of luck with all of that and Thank i look you. forward to it great to speak I'm, to you i'm really enjoying all of your your podcasts and everything like that and i highly recommend everyone tunes into them so thank you for coming on my show today and thank you to everybody tuning in at home. Be sure to share, subscribe, give this video a big thumbs up and leave lots of lovely comments. I'll see you all again soon for another episode of the Sarah O'Connell Show. Bye. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so thank much you for Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun and thanks. Really good questions. Sometimes people, you know, don't know what they're asking or whatever. So it was really nice to talk yeah. to someone. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Pleasure to come back. Cheers. Thank you.